So good morning and welcome. It's day eight already of the captain's blog and you join me here on the moorings at St Bennett's Abbey. Quite a few of the boats that were moored here have already departed. It's ten past nine. Some of them um, all going off down towards Roxham. But we've still got some few here but words. There's one from Richardson's. Um, and when I first woke up this morning it was pretty dull. It was even spotting with rain and I thought oh well the good weather's gone then. You know. Um, but now, um, the sun is trying to come out, there's some patchy blue sky, the wind's dropped, so it's looking like actually it's going to be another lovely day. Um, I'm not sure where to go today, really at all. Um, I want to go down Fleet Dyke and South Walsham, um, I need to stop up with some water. Um, and I was thinking about maybe mooring somewhere tonight where there's electric um, hookup, because I've got a bunch of these um, electric cards. You see, you buy these electric cards. They're a pound each. Um, I bought some, and then I realised I'd already got some from my last trip, so now I've got like loads of them. But they don't expire. What it means is that you probably see these blue posts along certain moorings, and if your boat's equipped with shore power, which is basically a, an electric hookup, you put one of these cards in. It's one pound of credit and then away you go. So then you can use you know, 240 volt appliances on your boat and you don't have to worry about draining the batteries. But also it means that the boat systems, like you know, the electricity you need to run your heater or your telly, that's all taken care of as well. It's not, it's not depleting your battery reserve uh, because most of the boats that have shore power have a inverter slash battery charger. So even when you're just leaving the boat and you're not using anything, it's um, charging your batteries up. Uh, so it's just a brief thing. Not all boats have this, most of the modern ones do, Barn Sprint Craft do, you know, people like Faircraft Loins, some of Herbert Woods do, some of Richardson's I think do their Premier Fleet but might well in the future. Um, but what you don't get is you don't get like, you know, free electric card or whatever. You can buy those from boat yards, you can buy those from Broad Authority Information Offices, you can buy them from post offices like in Horning, um, and, and then use the posts. Now there's not that many posts around, you know, there's one on the River Thurn at Potter High and there's one at Ersted, there's one at, or a couple at Ramworth. So they're spotted around and they become popular, especially in the winter with private craft wanting to, you know, more up and like, you know, use a fan heater for example. Um, but it is handy to have because then, um, you know, I don't have to worry about, well, the batteries. And I'm a very battery conscious person. Um, one light on, one light off kind of thing. I don't have all the cabin lights on. Um, when I'm on the broads, I don't use TVs. Um, I listen to the radio, usually classic FM, because um, it's relaxing. But oddly at home, I never do. I never listen to classic FM at home. So it's weird how here the atmosphere and my choice in music kind of changes and it's like chilled, especially smooth classics um, with Margarita Taylor. Uh, the woman that has such a soft voice, it's almost switching off and it will send you to sleep. But anyway, um, so that's nothing to do with what we're going to be doing today, but a little brief introduction about electricity cards, electric points and shore power and Classic FM. Um, so yes, I don't need anything. We went to Potheim yesterday. Um, we haven't visited Ramworth, so maybe we could try doing that as well today. Um, we haven't moored in Horning properly to go down to Lower Street. So there's a multitude of different things that we can sort of explore. Um, we'll go up the River Ant again if we can get under Ludden Bridge. So we'll see what the day does. It's early days and um, I'm feeling quite good today actually. I had a nice rest last night. Um, so just wanted to update you basically. Welcome to day eight. Um, it is a bit sort of at the present time trying to perk up the weather but it's not wonderful. Um, I've got the various cameras on charge, so um, these are great because these all these USB cables, they're all the same, they'll plug into a USB charger and a cigarette lighter socket. So, um, you know, charging up, I wish all things just had a USB charger, wouldn't that be simple? Anyway, so I'll charge it up, try and get that out on the, not the roof of the boat, and uh, do something similar to yesterday, which I've reviewed the footage and it was more interesting scenes you know oh here's a sailing yacht taken across press record rather than just me talking so as and when something interesting occurs or i've got something to say more as it happens 
Departing a mooring is always a tricky situation when the wind is blowing the boat onto the mooring. I can't leave going forward because that wind will surely push me straight into bronze gem in front of us, so I have to leave going backwards out of the mooring. I'm not using the bow thrusters at any stage during this manoeuvre and there is a boat behind me just as close as bronze gem is in front of me. Being alone when you're doing this means extra care and attention is needed because you've got no one there to help fend you off. But let's see how it's done. heading towards Horning um, and you know I said earlier how the sun was trying to come out and there was blue sky nah the clouds I'm afraid are winning at the present time and more than just the clouds is the wind now when I left uh, St Bennett's the wind was quite strongly blowing the boat against the bank I like this because when you're solo helming you've obviously got to untie the boat and get on the boat and then depart the mooring. If you're in a situation where the wind is blowing the boat away from the bank, then of course, whatever rope you untie, the boat will immediately, if you untie the, the bow rope, will want to drift away in that direction. If you undo the stern rope, the same will happen. So what I tend to do in those situations is loosen off the ropes as much as possible, and then very quickly, undo the, the bow, hold on to the rope, undo the stern, hold on to both ropes and then at the last moment put the rope on the side deck for the bow, leap on the back of the boat with the stern, don't worry about how coiled up or neat the ropes are, get to the helm and by then the boat should have been drifting away from the bank and you're now at the helm in control. Um, that's especially so certainly on some more secluded moorings like the dike that leads to Womack Water for example where there's a series of bends so it's uh, important that you get on the boat and underway um, quickly because there could be a boat coming around the bend and obviously they might meet a boat side on in the middle of the river but today wasn't like that today in fact was a case where the the, the wind as I said was blowing onto the bank so because I could untie the stern and I could untie the bow and the boat just sat there pinned against the bank. That then means you've got to get away from the bank and that can therefore be a challenging proposition. What a lot of people do is they react just the same as if they're driving a car or they react the same as maybe when they moored up the other day whereby the boat was maybe you know being gently blown away from the bank. So it's important that we think about this when you're leaving your mooring because if the wind is blowing you against the bank and you set off in forward gear and for example you're moored on a left hand side bank and you turn the wheel to the right the bow will start to go out and you'll think all is good and then the next thing you'll feel the stern hit the bank and go boom 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 scrape scrape so you might think okay I need to put more right hand lock on and more throttle and then you wonder why not only is the, the stern still not coming away from the bank, but now the bow is seemingly also going into the bank and you're just 
scraping down the bank, running out of room, before you reach the, the boat in front, where you have to then stop and reverse back up again and try again. Maybe you've got crew and they're trying to push the bow of the boat away from the bank and as quickly as they're doing that, it's being blown back in again. And you're sat there thinking, how oh, the hell are we going to get away from the bank? Well, you have to do something that's kind of the exact reverse of what you think you need to do. If you've got crew with you, that's really easy. What you do is, is you get the bow rope one wrap round the post and they stand on the bow so it's not tied to the post they're in control they're holding this okay then whoever's at the helm turns the wheel not away from the bank but into the bank all the way all the way to the left we're assuming the bank is on the left hand side put a little bit of throttle not much and you will see that the stern drifts out and the bow is being held pinned against the bank by the post. When the, the stern is sufficiently pointing at say 45 degrees from the bank, you shout to your person on the bow with the rope, let go, and they let go of the rope and pull it in quickly, and now the bow is free. Now, keeping the wheel where it is, go astern, go into reverse, but with a good amount of revs because you've got to clear the bank now then you will actually reverse out towards the middle of the river, well away from the bank. Once you're there, you can then put your throttle down forward to go forward, correct your steering, and make way. Okay? Now, I haven't got someone to help me do this um, with the bow rope. I've just got me. So what I have to do in such circumstances is basically to do exactly the same, turn into the bank, but I use a good punch of forward throttle to kick the stern out, but before the front of the boat touches the bank, it's quite a skill, then go into reverse, but because my stern is not yet sufficiently out to be able to, to enable me to reverse straight out. Now today, I had Bronze Gem in front of me, and River Song behind me, very close, they put maybe sort of five foot distance between my stern and you know my back and their back so quite close to get out of so let's do this a couple of times which is forward back forward back a bit more and as I'm leaving the bank I can put more forward for longer to get the stern out and when it's sufficiently uh, pointing in the direction of the middle of the river then I can go right back out of the river and then I turn my wheel the other lock and then that actually brought the boat round to turn towards Horning without the use of any thrusters. And then I was able to turn straight back up again, forward gear and, and power off. So that's how you leave a mooring if you're being pinned against it in the wind. Of course, if you've got bow thrusters and stern thrusters, you can try doing it with those. But bear in mind that they are power output, their horsepower, isn't that much, and in a stiff wind they will not have enough power to overcome that or in a stiff current and, and so the boat will still be pushed wherever the wind or the current wants it to go to. So your main best friend in such circumstances is the good old engine and your propeller. So remember that guys, you have no real control about the front of your boat. Even with bow thrusters, in certain conditions, the wind or the current will render those pretty much useless because they just haven't got the power. But you've got a hell of a lot more power behind you and you've got the rudder and you can do more with the back of the boat than the front of the boat. And because it's all about practice, you can try these things that are quite more. And let's take Cow Hill, for example, on the River End. Imagine you went there and there's no boats, you know, 20 foot in front of you and 20 foot behind you. It's good to have a practice. It's good to talk to your crew about stuff, you know, make, make you know, it's a family or some friends. You can make it feel a bit more, you know, special or, you know, feel the parts of, right, you're the captain, you're a second in command, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, call yourself a crew. You are your crew in the boat. And, you know, just have a little talk about things and let's give this a go and, 
if you, if it doesn't work out for you very well, well, you know, you haven't damaged anything. It's not that like you crashed in someone's boat while you were practicing something. So, but if it goes well, you think, oh, bloody hell, that was really good. Right, okay, well, you know, if we get in that situation again, we can sort that out. Or you, you do it one year and you come back holiday next year and you think, do you know what this requires? Remember that thing we did last year? Yeah, we'll try that. So, those sort of things you just learn. It's like, you know, when you learn to ride a bike, for example, or, what you know, use a tool and it just sort of sticks in the back of your mind and you, you can just, you know, pull it out when required. So, we're on Ramworth Dam, by the way, um, despite me going on about sort of talking about mooring and goodness knows what. <laughs> um, and there's a few boats coming towards us, so that, that's good. That probably means that there's space at um, Ramworth um, Stave. Now, because well, I've just been talking to you all about, you know, oh, if you're pinned against the bank and what to do and if it's windy. Well, here we are, we're going to be coming into Ramworth in a high-sided boat with a planing hull and a very light bow and I've got to back into a mooring, probably between two boats and I know that there's going to be an interesting crosswind situation so don't by any means think that um, if, if there is space that this mooring is going to go anything to plan <laughs> And that's the nature of the beast of what a boat is. You're on, you're on liquid that's constantly moving. You're being able to be blown around by the wind that's constantly changing. And you are, to a degree, at, at the mercy of those two different conditions, the wind and the water. There's nothing behind us. So I'm just going to get the old binoculars. These are really nice, these are. These are um, Olympus. Nice little purchase off of Amazon uh, warehouse deals. My uh, camera that I'm using came from Amazon warehouse deals. Um, basically, someone bought these, didn't like them, sent them back. Then they give a good discount on it. You buy it, you've still got a 30 day money back guarantee, 12 month warranty. Um, but you're saving money. So whenever I'm buying something like, you know, tech, I always have a look if there's any sort of open box deals on Amazon Warehouse. So if you just Google Amazon Warehouse, you'll find, you know, how you can have a look yourself. I have kind of sold my soul to Amazon, it has to be said. But, you know. There is space at the stave. Now, Here's an interesting point. If you know Ramworth Stave, you know there's the front of the stave that looks out across the broad, and then there's the side bit. So there's lots of space on the side bit, and there's one or two spaces on the front bit. Now what we're gonna do in this situation is, we're gonna look at the flag that's flying on the stave, we're gonna see what way the wind's blowing. So the wind is blowing from my right to my left. It's playing across this way. So that means that if I'm more on the front of the stave, as I turn the boat round, the wind is going to want to shift me um, across basically the face of the stave. If I try to more the same thing at the side of the stave, it's going to be coming bow first. <coughs> Sorry, the wind. So I think the best option is basically to do it on the side of the stave because then as I turn the boat the wind's going to come straight on my bow might even help push me you know reverse me into the into the key heading so I think that's the option that we're going to go for and as I say that another boat is departing so everybody's leaving okay so I'm approaching the stave at the present time I really don't know what to do because the wind is just so changeable at the present time um, so I might try more um, on the front of the stave rather than the side. Uh, 
I suppose we can give it a go at the front. But I know that this boat is just going to be so easily blown sideways the minute I turn in, you know, side on to that wind, just because of the, the sheer windage, that's how high the boat is sticking up out of the wind, out of the water. So I moored at the front of the stave um, and that went really actually quite well. Um, just needed one very brief little bit of bow thruster correction. Um, but then the minute that I touched the key and went to get the rope off, the rope was caught round the railing. So uh, we went wandering a little bit but we're all safely tied up now. Um, I'm not going to deploy the mud weight, I'm not going to be here for, for too long. Um, and the bow isn't really moving too much because we're nice and secure at the back. So um, I'm just going to have a little bit of a chill out session here. It's just 10 o'clock, might go for a walk. Um, but yes, we made it. And uh, we didn't hit any other boats. There's a private boat next to me here. and We've got gold gem to my right. Um, but anyway, more as it happens. Well, as you can see, um, I've changed the mooring from where I was. I filled up with water. And then I noticed that the side of mooring had uh, the electric post um, with 67 pence of credit on it. So I've plugged in and literally just moments after doing that and getting back on the boat, um, the rain has started. And you can see more on the windscreen here, just the amount of rain. So I'm not sure if this is just going to be a passing shower. But it certainly has turned into quite a gloomy, chilly-ish feeling day. Not, not too cold, but just um, a day where I'm kind of wondering, you know, do I really want to do too much? I was going to go for a walk, but I don't really want to go walking in the rain. Um... So we'll see, this is a nice mooring, I'm getting some free juice, so I think this may be, um, from my point of view, quite a uh, relaxing day. You know, with not too much cruising going on and just sort of actually taking a day of um, being lazy for once and not you know going here there and everywhere but because that means if I do that then for you watching this day eight just becomes well he went from St Bennett's and he went to Ramworth and he moored up and oh well that was a short day so um we'll see what happens with the weather um I'm going to stay here for a couple of hours if it brightens up the rain stops then we might go somewhere else um, I pretty well want to stay overnight here, by the way, um, just because as more boats come and then you, I feel very crowded in and then like your next door neighbour might put the telly on late and then 
the other boat next to you, you know, they might be up laughing and joking and it just feels like a cacophony of boaty sounds and you're in the middle of it all kind of thing. So I prefer side on moorings um, or moorings away from others. Um, so, you know, you're not disturbed. So, um, but that's basically all that's happened. Basically moored at Ramworth, started raining, great old day. So it's been an interesting uh, morning. Um, as you know, the last time I updated you, it was raining, it was great, it was horrible. Then it got even worse and there was hail. Oh my goodness. Um, and it was really windy and it was just like this squall came from nowhere. And then I thought, well, that's it. You know, it's just going to be rain's just going to sit in for the whole day. Then it eased off a little bit. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, I've been a little bit just sort of concerned that the boat's charging system hasn't been performing 100%. Now, you know that earlier on in the blog, um, an engineer came and he found there was a problem with one of the batteries, replaced the battery. And I might add as well, Barnes Printcraft used um, Rolls batteries. Um, so if you know by brands of batteries and how much they cost, um, you will well, just go and Google Rolls batteries and you will find that they are some of the best manufactured batteries um, out there. So anyway, um, replace the battery and it's been okay but it's just been a bit like the when the engine's running it doesn't seem to be pulling all of the, the volts out of the alternator and putting them in the batteries. So I was humming and ahhing and stuff and I phoned up Barnes Printcraft and I had a word with this guy called David um, who's one of the engineers there and I explained the situation to him anyway. So he pops down, he has a look at it and uh, sure enough finds there is a problem with the split charging diode. Basically what had happened is, is the negative wire uh, to come loose in its insulation holder. So because of where this is and in relation to things like you know the engine vibrating and stuff like this, um, these things can happen and to look at it, it looks like it's connected because you've obviously got the spade terminal and the wire coming out the end who would think that it wasn't connected? But it wasn't, so a new wire was made up and bingo! Suddenly all of the charge from the alternators going into the batteries and so everything is hunky-dory and, and sorted out. Now I've said this before, there is always the, the chance of a problem to, to pop up on a boat. Um, the amount of hours, hires, in and out, in and out, year after year. Um, and all the systems on the boats and everything else, things can go wrong. Some of them are really simple, tiny things, and some of them are a bit more serious. Um, you know, loose wires and, you know, batteries and so on and so forth. Um, but it's how it's sorted out, and I've really got to say that I'm the one who feels the guilty party because I phone up saying, mm, you know, I'm sorry to bother you again, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I would hate it to have someone come out, spend time, you know, looking at stuff, prodding, poking, multimeter reading, pulling at wires and stuff, and go, no, there's nothing really I can see at all, and you know, feel like, well, it's just a wasted trip. So it's it's almost good that um, that there there is a problem, and it's now fixed. So it's fixed for me. It's fixed for the next people that take the boat over. And I think also, if you're hiring a boat and there is a niggly issue or this doesn't, don't just think. Oh, oh bloody hell this isn't working properly you know inform the boatyard because they want to put it right to make your holiday okay and they also want to put it right so that all these little things there's only so much that can be checked and serviced during the the sort of the period between you bringing the boat back at like 9 a.m in the morning and someone else going out at say half two in the afternoon so it's through, you know, sort of customers advising and interacting and saying, you know, by the way, you know, this is, you know, not right or whatever, that those sort of prospective thoughts can be sorted out. So that's my tip of the day. So now we've got a fully working charging system. Um, and I'm actually plugged in at Ramworth's um, electric point as well. And that's what sort of made me think, hmm, I'm not sure about this. Because when the shore power was plugged in, you know, it was like seemingly very good. And when the engine was running, it wasn't quite the same. And I know that there's a 70 amp charger on this boat and a, probably a 60 amp alternator. So the alternator's not going to put out as much amps as the charger, but still. Anyway, 
enough talk about batteries charging issues. It is now just after one o'clock, there is no rain, there is blue sky, the wind has dropped, and I'm a happy bunny. So, we're not going to stay at Ramworth, we're going to go somewhere else. I think we're having a little bit of an explore. So, um, maybe you'd like to join me on our little exploratory um, sort of trip around the Northern Broads. It's Saturday, tomorrow is Sunday, and then I've got Monday as well. But Monday really is pretty much an off day. Um, it's time for packing, it's time to do the boat review. See, you normal souls that come away on holidays, <laughs> you just sort of think, oh, I'm going to... Let's go to Roxham today, let's go and have fish and chips, let's go on the Beaver Valley Railway, or whatever it is. Whereas I'm like, right, okay, let's make a, let's try and make a good day's blog. Oh, we've got to do the review, we've got to do this, you know, so, um, it's an, this is why I call it more trips than holidays now. Um, but I love it. I love, I love, um, time on the broads, I love the different people I meet along the way, um, Sometimes I get frustrated doing these blogs because I'm thinking they're rubbish. Um, oh, I've got to do this. Oh, that wasn't very good. But then I come to edit them. I think actually that was bloody good. Um, and I also like the, the the people I meet from these blogs. You know, being moored up here and someone's um, you know popped along and said, oh hi, you know, like like see your blogs on on the old YouTube's and stuff. So. Whether that's inspiring people to come, or come more often, or give it a go, or pick up their own camera and film their own experiences, then, you know, that's all good. So, anyway, I don't know where we're going to go. As I said, we're going to have an explore. Um, it is a little bit... Um, it's not like yesterday. Yesterday was really warm. Today is a little bit of chill in the air. I wouldn't be surprised if a bit later the rain does pop back again and sort of say hello, here's a sprinkle of water. But um, right now we're going to leave Ramworth and head somewhere else. More as it happens. Coming up to the uh, mouth of the river Ant, and I've just spent 15 minutes talking to the camera about inverters and power, DCAC, all sorts of stuff. 
um, and I thought, my god, don't I just go on sometimes? So I'm going to compress that down, I think, into uh, a smaller sort of nugget, just having a look ahead of me, what's going on there. Um, so first of all, update, sun's increasing in strength, wind's increasing, could be interesting. Mouth of river ramp on left hand side, on the river pure. So, what was I talking about for 15 minutes? I'm going to try not to take 15 minutes to explain. Um, basically, what I've de 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 determined is that a lot of the stuff that people bring with them on boats is to charge cameras, phones, tablets, stuff. You know, it's all to charge up. And so much of it is charged using USB. Even the, like this camera here, it's charged by USB. But I've got external battery chargers from my other camera that have a transformer to plug into the, uh, the wall socket. But guess what comes out of the wall socket transformer? USB. So you can charge it on USB. My phone can charge over USB. Um, there's so much stuff that can be charged using a USB charger, right? And what you get, I mean, this boat here, look at this, this is old. This is like a proper um, cigarette lighter, like you'd get in the car, old, old school stuff. The camera won't focus on it. But anyway, you know what I mean. You put it in, you press the button, and then it glows hot. And then in the old days, you go, oh, darling, that was a particularly nice cigarette, yes. Mm. Okay, anyway. But you can buy these, okay, but they have two USB sockets in them, one 5 amp and one like 1 1.2 or something. So the 5 amp one can be used for tablet charging and the other one can be used for your phone charger. And I thought how good would it be if you had a couple of those on the dash, a couple in the cabins, you know, it doesn't need to be 240 volt, it's just 12 volt charging at the most efficient way. So instead of using the inverter to take 240 volts, knock it back down to 12 volts using the wall charger thing, and then comes out at like, you know, one point something amps at 3 volts. Don't need to worry about any of that. And they're not much money, these accessory things with the USB chargers. They're about 20 quid, I think. But I've seen them in Chandler's and, and, and stuff like that. I'm just passing the moorings for St. Bennett's Abbey, by the way. Um, so that was, that, was that, that was that that I covered. And the other thing as well was basically, generally speaking, lots of people don't really understand about how it all works, like inverters. They, they hear these words inverters. Oh yeah, you can bring your hairdryer as long as it's not too high powered or use it on low with the inverter. Well, it's really simple basically. So you know you've got DC direct current and AC alternating current. At home, we've got our AC coming in to the house at sort of 240 volts. It's not clean power, it's, it's a pretty dirty, it's not exactly 240, it goes all over the show. So for sensitive sort of computers and even your modern telly, you might want to have a, a strip that, that filters the power and has a surge protector just to basically try and help it. They do have built-in sort of uh, filters in their power supply modules, but even so, I like to at home. That's neither here nor there. Basically, have you ever noticed, like, the charger for your phone, how small it is? Right, you plug it in the wall, like an Apple iPhone charger, it's tiny. It doesn't get very hot, does it? But it's basically taking 240 volts, and it's putting out about 3 volts at, like, 1.5 amps. Right? So why is that so easy to do? But if you want to have, like, a boat, and it's 12 volt supply and supply like a thousand watts of 240 volt power. Do you have to have this big metal box with a fan in and it gets hot? You know, what's all that about? Well, it's just the way it is. It's physics. It's really easy to convert um, 240 volt AC to DC, whatever it is, whether it's like 3 volts DC, 12 volts DC, but it takes a hell of a lot more stuff to happen to convert 12 volts to 240 volts and because of it is inefficient and it gets hot that's where you're losing like a lot of your your efficiency so it might be like 80 percent efficient 
at converting it. So you're losing a load of your power that you're putting in in here. That's just gone. Um, so your 1000 watt hair dryer from home, and yeah, that's another problem. You've got like a, a 2400 watt hair dryer, and you have to use it on low setting. And then if you accidentally forget on the boat and use it on high setting, inverted trips, and you go, oh no, I've got no hair dryer. So it's all a compromise, and that's just, you know, how it is. Now you can mitigate against this um, by different inverters are better than others, like pure sine wave and fake sine wave. If you had an oscilloscope, basically, I think it's like a 60 hertz, or is it 50 hertz? Anyway, it's a wave, peaks and troughs. And a pure sine wave inverter does basically the same as what we get through our wall sockets at home. But most inverters, the cheaper ones especially, which are not that cheap by the way, but um, basically fake that, that frequency. And some things are fine with it and some things won't work with it. Like washing machines won't work with it and this is pure, not that I've got a washing machine on the boat, you know what I mean. So um, microwaves on boats, that's another thing use a great deal of power, don't work as efficiently as when you're at home, you've got to run the engine in high revs to keep them going. And don't be fooled if the microwave says like 800 watts, that it just uses 800 watts. No, it will use more than that. That's just like the nominal cooking power of the magnetron, not all of the power that it actually will use, especially on startup. So um, it's really complicated power and boats. And all batteries do is store power, they don't make the power. So you can only put so much into them. So then you get bigger battery banks. Four, five, six, seven, eight batteries. But then you've got to charge those big banks of batteries somehow. And then people don't want to run the engine for too long or cruise for too many hours to different places. So then you've only sort of replenished 40% of the charge that you took out yesterday evening. So, you can often tell when the batteries are charged by even the volt gauge on, on the dash. Now, previous to the engineer coming and fitting that, that wire that was loose, um, it would be around about 13 volts. Now it's charging at 14. But when the batteries get full, it won't be at 14 anymore. It will just sort of slacken off a bit because the batteries will basically be like, oh, I can't take no more charge. And not necessarily all boats, but some will have an intelligent charging system. It's like, okay, cool. Let me to give you so many amps now then. Calm down. And it will reduce the, the amperage flow to the batteries. Because if you give them too much for too long, then that damages the batteries. If you don't give them enough for too long, that damages the batteries. If you take too much power out of batteries, that damages the batteries. If you don't check the electrolyte level, that damages the batteries. Batteries are just pain in the ass things. And even the best AGM gel batteries, when you look at them, how many discharge, recharge cycles you can get out of them, it might be like, six to eight hundred and that's only like eighty percent discharge to one hundred percent discharge so when you basically discharge a battery by fifty percent oh no <laughs> don't think you've got a hundred percent charge and you can use it down to zero and then recharge it back up to a hundred mm -mm. fifty percent of a battery's charge and then you're like ah, if you go any lower than that you could damage your battery <laughs> it's like Lithium-ion batteries. Dangerous bloody little things they are. If you look at them wrong, they catch fire. Get too hot, catch fire. Get too cold, catch fire. Put too much charge in, catch fire. Discharge them too much, catch fire. Drop them, crack them, step on them, crush them, catch fire. So, yeah. But now we've got graphene. A promising new technology for batteries. 
10 minutes and 8 seconds. Not as bad as before when I did 14 minutes, didn't go on as much, did I? Be, be thankful, you just had to bear with 10 minutes of random nonsense talk. We're on the River Bure, heading towards the River Thurn, more as it happens. The weather is brilliant now, um, it's lovely sunshine. In fact, actually, I think the camera is focusing more on what's going out on the window than, than me at the present time, so I need to uh, have a faff around with the exposure setting. So, come on, camera, come on. Yeah, oh no. Oh dear, I need it to uh, focus and um, automatically exposure itself from the centre of the image and not from the wider extremities of the image. Let's see if I can do it. Okay, two things have happened. I think I've had too many cans of Coke, which is why I'm being a bit hyper. Um, I don't normally have that much Coke. I used to, but well, I only have Diet Coke now. But um, I usually have squash, blackcurrant and apple sugar-free squash. Um, and that doesn't contain any caffeine in it. So I've been having a bit of a binge of caffeine, and I think that's why I'm a bit more hyper. But I fixed the exposure issue, should be uh, exposing me right now. Um, anyway, we're on the Thurn. The reason why we're on the Thurn is because of Thurn Dyke. I haven't been there for a very long time. Um, and I was last there as a kid. There was a little shop, and I bought a wooden miniature trawler. Now, I'm pretty sure that that shop's long gone. I know that the, the pub's still there, but um, so we're gonna have a little explore down there, but my goodness me, this wind, it's blowing like this. And we're just sort of going a bit sideways at the moment. Like literally, the boat is doing, I'm pointing the bow this way, but the boat is doing this. Even the boat in front of me is um, having a little bit of an issue. Why the uh, the dinghy thing coming towards us is just down the middle of the river, I don't know. Because it's under power. Oh, that's what it needed. It just needed a it just needed a higher boat. They sink it up the way of a higher boat. They're like bloody hell. <laughs> this is weird. Brinks Royale was a was a planing hole and it would do weird things on the river end and that was much more wind than this. But but this boat is I, it's almost like I can just Oh my god! I've invented Norfolk Broads drifting. You can literally get this boat at the right wind strength to just and the right throttle, that's too much. It needs about 1750. There we go. We're now drifting down the river. The bow is pointing this way, but we're actually sterns just a bit like this, and we're going in a straight line. <laughs> like the Japanese, and they're drifting. Okay, calm down, straight up. So yeah, you need the right wind, strength, direction. What's that series of films called? It's not Need for Speed. Oh God, what are they called? Why can't I remember it? Why can't I remember that? There's loads of them. They're incredibly famous. Loads of people love them. They're completely implausible plots, but hey, what the hell is it? Not Need for Speed? Speed with a P? No. Faster than the Furious, oh bloody hell. Jesus Christ, you get there in the end, like bloody British Rail. Yeah, Faster and Furious, you know, drifting and all the rest of it. Well, there you go, I've invented Norfolk Board's boat drifting on the River Third. <laughs> right, here we are, we're at the Third Dyke now. Calm down because we've got some more. Now, what side of the dike do I want to come in on? Should 
should they go down this backwards, do you think? No. Oh no, no, no! You can't turn a 45 foot boat in Fern Dyke! Now you've just got stuck across the river! Oh no, there's mooring rings. Oh, I've completely cocked up here. I don't like mooring rings because I can't easily... Um, I'm commit... Oh. Right. The boat in front of me is, is abandoned trying to turn itself round. Sorry, it wasn't a 45 foot boat. Let's just squeeze down here. I know you can't see what's going on. I'm really sorry. I would like, like to turn um, the camera for you, but I've got to concentrate at the present time. I didn't realise there wasn't any posts. Because in the wind, it's a bit tricky to um, feed the ropes through the little rings. I'm going to turn down here to have a bit of bow thrust resistance. Turn this camera on outside here. And then you'll get an idea of uh, what's going on. And also turn the roof one on. to turn this boat in this narrow part of the dike. I'm not sure if I like this. The wind's just pushing the boat down the dike towards the pub. And I'm not really in control of it.
so we're on the uh, River Bure approaching the moorings for St Mennings Abbey and it's turned into a real day of two halves. Woke up this morning, it wasn't that great. Got to Ramworth, it started to rain, then it got windy, then the rain got really heavy and then the boat got sorted out, then the rain stopped, then the sun came out and now the winds come out to play. So um, I, w I really wasn't expecting to do very much at all today. I was going to thinking, you know, it was much the same as going to Ramworth. It's going to pour with rain. I leave Ramworth, go somewhere else, and say, okay, guys, well, you know, we're more up here now, and that's the end of that. But it's actually turned into a um, very pleasant afternoon. Um, looking at the banks, I think the, the, the river level is quite high, which wouldn't surprise me too much because we did have quite a strong wind last night and especially the wind and you know the pressures off of the east coast affect the tides on the Norfolk Broads you know delay them or just stop them um, and then causes the water to be higher than usual or it should be so um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was only like eight foot clearance at Ludden Bridge um, if so not going to try and go under so that leads me to think of where we could more well Where could we more? South House Broads, that's very nice, uh, very picturesque, sheltered. Um, other than that, that's the first thing that came to mind. There's Horning again, but then if I'm more somewhere like Horning, that's just going to encourage me to think, oh, I'll just go and get some food and I need, I need to be self sufficient. I, I've bought food, I've got to use it. Um, same goes for Roxham. So really, it would be nice to go up the river ramp. But I know two things. First of all, even if there is sufficient clearance under the bridge, in this, this gusty winds, it's going to be a case of go for it. Not faffing around and thinking about it. And Because if you've got a couple of boats in front of you and one behind and they stop and then you're drifting, you're drifting to the side of boats I think in those situations it's best just to turn around and go, you know, and come back again than try and wait and just drift and bash into stuff. But um, anyway, it is a lovely day. I'll show you, there's a, there's a yacht here, it's just got, um, it's, it's, I don't know, what's, it's not his mainsail, it's its other one at the front, which isn't, I'm no good with yachts, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the one you use when it's quite windy and you don't need to have too much sail up. Anyway, I'll show you what it looks like. So that's the sail he's got up, that one there that's fluttering and it's sort of, um, it's tied up at the top and they call that something as well, y yachty people, that I don't know what that's called but I, I would recognise it if I heard it. I suppose i better just get past him quickly here, because he's going to tack across. What's that called when... Reefed, that's it, he's got it reefed. So I don't know what the sail's called that he had up there anyway. I can try canal boating possibly, and I wouldn't mind going on a on a sailing boat, you know, giving it a go. But um, to have one and you know do stuff with it, nah, don't really want to do that. Okay, so 
we've gone from a really windy, choppy river Bure to immediately very much calmer Fleet Dyke. Fleet Dyke um, goes to South Walsham Broad, and there's two broads, South Walsham Inner and South Walsham Outer, you'll see it on the map. You're allowed in both of them, but you can't mud weight on the inner broad, only on the outer broad. It was Fleet Dyke that used to have a lot of informal moorings in as much as they had a key heading and it was grass. There was no post, you had to use your rond anchors. And it was this area that first had the treatment by the Environment Agency of, of um, dealing with the flood defences. So all these banked areas with the key heading, they were basically there as, as a flood defence. Okay? And, and for years and years and years, you had the, the EA and the Broads Authority, either one or the other or both, um, keep the key heading in good order and, you know. And then it's been decided that they're going to use this new method, as you've seen with the JCBs and the, the sculpting of the banks at a, a quite acute angle into the water, and then making the top of the banks very much flat. Um, and, and a bit taller than they used to be and then having it just as reeds um, and the reeds will help sort of take away the uh, the bite out of passing boats, boat wash and the angle of the bank will as well but of course Fleet Dyke for example was a prime example where um, can I say example any more often where it lost these very nice picturesque moorings so you had the moorings at St Bennett's but you could moor on Fleet Dyke almost opposite St Bennett's Abbey and have a much quieter, more restful mooring because it's off the main river. You still can, but it means that you have to jump off the boat, and I've done it, into the reeds and, and kind of cut some of the reeds down so you can then, you know, find a place to put your rond anchor in. Now over the season you'll see people, especially fishermen, will do this and you'll see little bits of, of gaps and green grass where they've done it and there's, and there's an example just coming up here actually where there's a, a boat moored, private boat. But um, it's just a shame that, that they've been lost and some of the other moorings will go the same way like there was some on the, the main river Thurn where it was just grass, you'd have to use your rond anchors but you had the key heading to come into and the fenders to touch and you know But just further down Fleet Dyke you'll find on your left hand side some formal moorings with key heading and everything and that's another favourite of many people to come and moor up here. I'm just giving this a little check out just to see what it's like as a possible overnight for tonight. It's only a short way down from the River Bure. In fact if you look on Google Maps at Fleet Dyke I believe this is the way that the River Bure used to go. So it used to go in and round in a big sort of loop. And um, the, the, the former sort of tail end of that loop is now just a little sort of drainage dike. But you can clearly see how it used to be, the river one. So there's many things like the River Ant never used to um, have its mouth on the River Bure. Um, it used to empty into the River Thurn. And the River Thurn, in, in, I understand, used to um, come out to sea... Well, it used to come out to sea. <laughs> you know, it, it didn't empty into the Bure and then down to Yarmouth. And this is many, many sort of hundreds or thousands of years ago that this all sort of was. It's not like recent history that they've started diverting rivers and stuff. It's like the um, ferry, no, Stokesby, and there, there used to be a ferry at the pub, and apparently there's a Roman causeway or, you know, under the river. And I know when I came through there that it was a very 
strange the currents at that point, as if it's all sort of eddying underneath the, the river. So there's lots of sort of little mysteries and lost things. I remember coming up to Fleet Dyke years and years ago when I was 18 on a boat called Diamond Haze um, from Diamond Cruises. It only lasted a year. Um, and we came to moor up at this piece of very low ground that was very boggy. This was an Ocean 30. It was just actually on this corner where it says shallow water. And that's where it used to go off and meet the River Bure, where it no longer does. But anyway, so this mooring, which I believe is this one here, I'll just turn the camera around. So I believe it was this mooring here, but it was very um, flat and, and, and low down. It wasn't all sort of like it is at the moment with the long grass and that tree there and stuff like that. But I'm sure that's it, because it wasn't there where the shallow water sign is. Anyway. So we came in tomorrow at this mooring, me and my mum. And basically, let's just put it like this, it was too shallow. And I'm not sure the boat actually went aground, but it was very close to. And I remember seeing the amount of silt that was being stirred up by the propeller and absolutely panicking and shouting, you know. And we'd moored up, I'd go off the boat with the ropes and everything. And I was like, we can't stay here. Oh my God, we're gonna be stuck. And my mum's going to me, oh, well, I didn't know what you want me to, I don't know what we're gonna do. We're gonna be stuck here. You know, in typical sort of like panicked, you know, what the hell are we gonna do? So we got back on the boat and we were able just to motor away. But um, yes, it was a bit worrying. I like it how privateers just come round bends on the wrong side of the river going too fast and just look at you smugly like, and? So these are the moorings that are just on the, the inside of the bend. They've got the posts and everything and as I say they're a popular spot. So you can mud wait here and then if you turn the boat like we are just now you'll see this little sort of inlet so I don't know if you can just see just there is the inlet that is what leads to South Walsham in abroad. Now there is some shallow water in there and there's some markers that you know denote um, where that is and stuff but you can't mud wait in there. But I've been in and out and around much smaller than this. My memory serves. This is a very popular place, especially in the summertime. A lot of 
sort of almost regulars come here, you know, oh yeah, lovely fleet dikes, South Walsham Broad. Often sort of forgotten though otherwise, you know, lots of people just see that dike opposite St Bennett's Abbey Moorings and think, oh I wonder where, where that is or what's that over there kind of thing. be nice to have a house here that you know you just come down to your garden that house there with that um, boat moored at the end of it I think that's to me the ultimate you have a large house in a picturesque location and at the back of the house you've got a lovely garden and your boat moored at the front of the house you've got like a big gravel driveway and your nice car. <laughs> so that's the uh, you can really tell because I've got the window open. But um, the wind's got up again and it, it wouldn't be a very tranquil place to mount away at the present time. So we're going to make our way back the way we came from and the next time I'll be speaking to you will be when I'm telling you um, what the height is on the river around Aladdin Bridge so we'll see what that's like I'll update you then so a sure sign that we're approaching the River Bure as you can see the landscape has changed the trees have gone and you can see just how much those reeds are blowing on our left and right hand side and how the boat is being affected by this wind. So it's meaning that it's suddenly becoming uh, wits about your time again with the, uh, with the boat and um, just trying to correct it as quickly as the wind is taking it, if you know what I mean. So it's a constant sort of left a bit, right a bit, left a bit more. When we turn onto the viewer we we'll are be turning left and I can already figure out by um, the direction of the wind is, is coming from this direction here it's pointing across like this so that will mean that if I go up the river around to London Bridge that wind will be coming from left to right of the bridge so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up get to the first bridge marker if that's not showing enough, I'm just going to turn round and uh, not, not going to go further up and closer to, to London Bridge Boatyard and all the moored boats to try and turn there. You can probably see the change in the, the water in front of us um, as the River Bure, of course, much wider, deeper river. And as we're going to turn on to this, so of course the uh, effect of those little waves will be far more noticeable. So now we're on to the much more lumpy river viewer. Now if you're in any of these boats that are moored up here, these sort of bathtubs, forward steer, it's not actually going to be too bad. But on this boat, although you can't pick it up on the camera, on the microphones, um, you do just get this constant slapping at the hole because of the shape of this hole. So to more there would result in not a very pleasant, comfortable afternoon. But it's not far to the river end. One 
one thing that surprises me, you see how wide the river is here. Um, yesterday when we were moored on, on these moorings, how close the passing traffic gets to the boats again. You've got to stay on the right hand side of the river, but that doesn't mean staying, you know, three feet from the moored boats because especially in conditions like this if anything was to happen and you had to suddenly turn to your left then of course your stern's just going to go slapping into whatever's moored there so keep a good distance but still to the right of the centre of the river successfully through Ludden Bridge, a um, bit touch and go to be honest with you. Um, basically uh, there was a yacht punting through in front of me, there was uh, two boats that had come through the bridge before him, there was a boat behind me and uh, it was almost sort of like everybody would just sort of funneled me through and I was like oh my god. So I approached the bridge and I thought, oh, well, I'm doing all right. And then at last minute, the wind caught me. Um, so we nudged the, the side of the uh, walkway as we went through the bridge. I did just sort of go astern quickly, um, just as the roof of the bridge, or the roof of the bridge, the top of the bridge, uh, the underside of the bridge technically, with the roof line, because the highest point of this boat is the sliding sunroof part. Um, it adds at least sort of, well I'd say nearly three inches to the roof of the boat, just the way it was designed. So, you know, if anything's going to touch the underside of Adam Bridge, it's going to be that. So I've got it just partially opened, um, and so I couldn't stick my head out through the roof um, and go through the bridge. But um, looking at how much, I mean, that's a very difficult thing to take. You look up at something and try and work out how much of a gap there is between it and the roof of the, the bridge. But anyway, we're through, that's the main thing. And um, the really annoying thing though is I don't know how high the bridge height is because the bridge height markers are so filthy. So, you know, I think it's about sort of eight foot seven, eight foot eight, but past eight foot three it just is dirty and then you're just having to guess well there's the water level that's sort of you know three inches between those two markers so I guess that's it's not not what it should be 
But anyway, calm down, stop ranting. It's a lovely day. We're on the river round. We're finding a mooring now, so when I'm not gonna moor at Hal Hill for example, well I might. But what I would quite like is a wild mooring on the right hand bank of the river. Because then I can come in, the wind will just keep me against the mooring. I can take my time with the rond anchors. And then once we're moored up, it'd be nice and quiet. So um, basically we're, we're going back down the river round because I've chickened out. Um, I've been coming up here and the wind's been increasing and I've been thinking to myself, this is a really not very pleasant journey. There was a boat in front of me that kept slowing down and stopping and hitting the reeds and I'm having to sort of, you know, try and negotiate behind it. And the more I'm thinking, I'm thinking, so you know, I find a nice mooring and it's all lovely and it's calm tonight. But what happens if, you know, tomorrow I come to go through Ludden Bridge and there is only eight foot clearance? You know, I'm, I'm completely buggered. There's no way this boat's going under there at eight, eight foot. So, you know, and then I say, okay, well, I won't go under Ludden Bridge today. I'll just stay this side of the end. I've got the time. But then, you know, if the wind and the tides conspire and it doesn't drop and, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be stuck to the wrong side of Ludden Bridge when I've got a boat that belongs back in Roxham. So, although maybe the sort of, uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's probably not the right thing to do. I'm probably worrying too much. But, better to be safe than sorry, as my mum would say. So, I've turned around because I know, just come through the bridge just now, there was bags of room, I can get back through the bridge, then tonight I won't be worrying like, oh my god, am I going to get under the bridge again? Um, and it just goes to show you, when you've got a boat that's sort of, you know, a bit touch and go with things, um, it can be a bit stressful. Not really stressed, but just anxious. You know, you're just suffering from a bit of anxiety and thinking, oh, will we get under? Yes, we've got under. Will we get back? So, um, the boats are being blown about left, right and centre here. I mean, it's just crazy. So, um, it's not, it's not a, oh, you can't really see me there. Hello. Um, yeah, it's not a very pleasant cruise down the river ramp today because you've just got to keep soaring at the steering wheel and watching out for other boats and one behind me, one in front of me. There was plenty of moorings at Ludden Bridge though, um, you know, but just the wrong side of the bridge for me. So, I think we might go to South House. Because as I say, it's a nice place down there, nice and sheltered. Mind you, those moorings on Fleet Dyke were nice and sheltered, weren't they? No, my luck, I'll end up on the River Bure at St Bennett's Abbey, doing what I just told you. Oh, you don't want to do that, you know, you have bow slap all night. <laughs> So I told you I'd update you where we're more. Here we are, Wild Mooring, Fleet Dyke, just off the River Bure. And I'm just going to end today's vlog quickly, um, just to say that another little tip to bring is some of these types of gloves. They're cotton on top, they're rubber, they've been dunked in rubber, so they're waterproof and grippy on the bottom. And I'll show you why that's important in a moment. But here we are, it's a very nice mooring, it's off the main river, the wind's blowing me on the shore all the time, so I have plenty of time to, to get, you know, my rond anchors, get off the boat, put them in, etc. The ground's soft but firm, so they're nicely in. There's some slack in the rope because the tide does obviously fall here a little bit, just off the main river Bure. But the reason why it's important to have these gloves, and I'm sorry about the wind noise on the mics, so I hope you can hear me. It's not long to go to the end of uh, this episode, guys. Is this, this is the old growth of the reeds. And as you can see, it's really straw-like. And what I've done is I've got down with my gloves and I've ripped all of the reeds off around the heater out there, because I don't want any of this catching fire. So that's a safety sort of precaution. But these are also good if you're dealing with wet ropes and stuff like this. And as you can see, this is one of the moorings at Fleet Dyke that has been used by a few people since this 
bank work's been done, we've got the grass. Bear in mind that the bank here, it does shelve an angle. It's not straight, it's low. So if you do do this kind of mooring, be careful getting on and off of the boat. And very quickly, we just go over here. This is the main flood defence bank here, as you can see. This is where the, the diggers come and level it out. Much of the marshland here is below the river level, which is why it's so important that they have these. But um, there is St Bennett's, there's the moorings, there's the main river Bure, there's us. The sun is warm, the sun will be setting in the next hour and a half. But I'm just on my own here, almost with my own little garden. and. Um, I can I can be here tonight and it'll make an ideal place to get up nice and early. I'm going to try and get really early and hopefully we'll be treated maybe with a good sunrise that I can capture. But if you've been watching today, it's been a bit of an all over day, hasn't it really? Been a lot of speech about nonsense and stuff. But at the end of the day, guys, this is really what it's all about. For me, finding a secluded mooring on a quiet stretch of river on the Norfolk Broads on a nice evening like this listening to the reeds in the wind rustling away it's just wonderful and just all of the stress and the worries that you ever had have just gone but from here on day 8 of the captain's blog from a bit of a windy fleet dyke annoying you no doubt on YouTube if you have been, thanks for watching. Until tomorrow, day nine. Hope you've enjoyed. So this is what it's all about. I've got me uh, beef just frying off here in the pan. Water's getting ready to boil for the pasta. Bolognese sauce is ready there. Got some BBC Proms 2014 on Spotify coming through the speakers. A nice chilled bottle of Pinot Grigier to go with this. And this is my view. How wonderful is this? And all right, maybe a little bit eccentric, but there's the sun setting, as you can see. Everything's really and Royal Britannia <laughs> happens to be playing as well. So uh, perfect end to a, a lovely day, and it's just these moments here when you can stand at your cooker and look out of that. It just is something unique and special and I just thought I'd just add this little bit at the end just to say, you know, if you haven't gone on a boating holiday, then why the bloody hell not? I mean, it's just a unique experience, I think, to be able to be cooking like this in a lovely location like this. So anyway, officially, 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 the end of day eight. Until tomorrow, we'll see what happens to him. Bye for now.